It takes a very special kind of person to want to play control decks, and that type of person tends to get kind of addicted to the type of power it yields. He's smiling because he thinks he's about to win the Pro Tour. Oh, I, I believe dead. he's correct. <laughs> and go ahead, Jackson is going to let it happen, and you are going to see even Flock of the Slovak Republic. You've never seen anyone play a turn so fast. In they come! It's the Angels and the Sheep for even Flock! We're talking about the history of blue eye control today. And for those of you at home like me, who before doing this video did not know the absolutely fabled path of this deck to get where it is now, it's a wild one. But before we do get into it, uh, there's a subscribe button at the bottom. And this took so much effort and research into making this video. So one of the only ways you can show us that it's, it's worth it or we should keep on doing this if it doesn't say you're subscribed, you can click it. It costs you nothing and it does us a huge favor. But let's delve into it. For those of you who still have their innocence, Azorius Control is a very popular archetype that many people are drawn to because of the aspect of control over your own fate. You are the master of the game and prey mostly to your own decisions. Azorius Control is often regarded as one of the most skill-intensive archetypes, preferred by some of the masters of the game. Magic has three main archetypes, control, aggro, and combo. Aggro intends on using less expensive cards and using an early burst of often less powerful creatures or burn spells to quickly overwhelm their opponent, who's often just playing one spell per turn like a noob. Combo carefully crafts his deck to find a way of usually winning in one single turn in a non-interactive manner. The more fair your opponent is playing, the more combo has a chance of simply winning on another axis, like playing another game altogether. Like I'm playing tic-tac-toe and you're playing paintball. Antonio has yeah. assembled the combo and that is good enough. Control on the other side intends to react. It's the spiritual opposite of aggro. The whole point of the game plan here is to attempt to slow down the game as much as possible, removing and countering all of your opponent's early aggression with spells that usually deal with more than one card at a time. Once the game is stalled out, and you're drawing more resources than AR and have more lands and mana available, that's how you win with inevitability. I mean, most of the time people just stop playing because it's inevitable, they can't win anymore, but but I had a couple people actually go through the motions and try winning, but once uh, once you Jace, look at the top of their library and let them keep it, it's usually over. <laughs> <laughs> you just show them a slow, grindy way to win the game that they will likely not be able to deal with and hope that they understand that they probably have better places to be and time is a fleeting, feeble, and intangible concept and why would they waste precious moments that they could be spending with their loved ones being pummeled for two every turn by a mutavolt? Control decks can take many forms, often containing black for direct removal of creatures, green for early mana advantage to eventually go bigger, or red, proving a form of removal for creatures and planeswalkers via some spicy hot damage. There are also other archetypes, like mid-range and aggro control, but we'll talk about those if we do the history of Jund or fairies. But today, we are doing blue-white control, a deck with one of the most fabled histories of the game. First, we want to go back in time during the wild west of magic. Pro Tours did not exist yet. There were no formats. Standards did not exist yet. The rarity of the cards actually affected deck building as there was no solid secondary market and the internet was still limited enough that there was no real metagame. One deck to rule them all began appearing on the chat forums and metagame blogs. As my main form of magic entertainment at the time came from a school bus and an overly eager school teacher that did not form a gathering of any sort, I called upon one of the most knowledgeable magic minds I know to help me navigate the early years of the game. Toby manages the insight section for card market. If you've ever followed written GP coverage, for example, in the last 10 or more years, you have definitely read his words. Displaying my utter lack of knowledge of how information was diffused at the time, I asked him his knowledge of the metagame in the early years. Actually, the, the history of early magic is super murky. The deck got its name because it was the first widely shared deck list that people ever used. Invented in 1996 by Brian Weissman, a professional player from Magic's early days and an important early contributor to Magic game theory. Some people have gone as far as to say as this deck contains no bad matchups, only good matchups, and it solely depends on the skill level of the player who's playing it. This deck would trade one for one with its powerful answers and would bridge into the late game where the sheer power of its card draw and finishers would close out the game. It could even sometimes just win with the opening of a Tundra, Mox Emerald, Black Lotus into Sarah Angel. To understand what's so special about this deck and why everyone was so excited about it, we have to understand how next level the design was. Well, it just beat everything. It is credited, and Wiseman is credited with the discovery of the concept of card advantage, essentially. It's, it's not just that it generated the most card advantage of the time, 
but also the most inevitability, essentially. It at least was the one that put white-blue control as an archetype uh, on the map in the mind of a large part of the player base. Uh, so did the deck win anything specifically? Well, there weren't proper tournaments back then, nothing the knowledge of which survived into the modern day. The combination of cards Brian came up with could not only deal with everything using Source of Plowshares and Counterspell, it also began the concept of focusing less on tribal strategy. Brian was not trying to get cute, he was simply bent on having the biggest pile of the most powerful cards he could find. This is trade binder magic. The deck would then win with one of the most iconic creatures ever printed in Magic's history. Making your opponent discard cards after countering and removing all of their threats made sure that all their source of plowshares and terrors were long gone from their hand by the time you resolved your Sarah Angel. You even played one copy of Amnesia to bring the gap into that point of the game as soon as possible. One of the really fun ones is a blast from the past and a twist on how that deck could just win. With its one copy of Mirror Universe, I know, I know this card is absolutely awful by today's standards, but the game had different rules at, at the, the time. time uh, the rules were that if you went down to zero life, you didn't lose immediately, but only at the end of the phase. Meaning that you could go down on life, as you sometimes would do anyway, playing a control deck, uh, and then uh, take damage from your own city of brass. Go down to zero life, activate mirror universe, exchange life totals with your opponent, and then at the end of the phase, it would be them dying and not you. But now let's talk about another big moment in the history of the game. The first ever Pro Tour in 1996. Yeah, oh. that is where tournament magic really started. It was uh, the first big money tournament, even though the prize pool by today's standards was pretty abysmal. The champion walked away with something like $8,000. The issue that early players had before then is that they'd printed cards that were way too powerful in the early iterations of the game. The first few sets contained cards like Time Walk and Channel. Every new release of cards would come with one overwhelming problem, which is how on Yargle do you ever make something more exciting than a Black Lotus? Watsi found a very clever solution and created a brand new rotating format, Type 2, never referred to as standard. You could only play cards from the last two or so years, and your deck had to contain at least five cards from each set. Requiring competitors to adapt to a brand new format premiered at this event. A Type 2 variant, the format required that all decks include at least five cards from each of the available Type 2 sets. This was since changed because the primary use of people's sideboards was then to just store bad Homelands cards. How do they get you to care about this new format with less powerful cards? Make a Pro Tour that only plays that format! The best way to play the game is to play Type 2, why aren't you? Ah, peer pressure. The new format came along with automatically banned cards, Channel and Mind Twist. Standard at the time even had a restricted list, meaning you could only play one of the card containing Black Vise, Balance, Felden's Cane for some reason, Ivory Tower, Recall, and Zurin Orb. Zurin Orb in particular also made for a combo with Balance, which both of the finalist stacks included, because back then you could uh, cast a sorcery, wait to pass the interrupt window where people could counter the Balance, but if they didn't, you could then still respond with instant effects. So you would sacrifice all your lands, gain a bunch of life, and your opponent would lose their lands for nothing. The very first Pro Tour was won by Michael Lacanto playing the only deck we care about today, Blue-White Control. That is a proper white-blue control deck. Uh, this one wins uh, by um, either control magic, enchanting something that the opponent puts out. Mostly it won uh, by milling the opponent out. The deck uh, includes three millstone. Although it's likely not the first deck to play millstone, it is the first type 2 deck that ever relied mostly on stalling the game and boring your opponent to death. Because the most important thing about millstone is not that it mills, no, it's not even that it's boring, it's that it's inevitable. If you play Recall and Felden's Cane in your deck, you can get your win conditions back, more than promising to win the game. You are making an oath to your opponent that you will not lose this. This means that if you ever get to a point where the game is stalled, they can either pick up their cards or waste both of your times. White-blue control from the very beginning, always about inevitability. And win conditions were pretty bad back then, so that's what you had to deal with. Millstone, Mishra's Factory. It never focused on uh, closing the game, but rather uh, delaying and uh, controlling the pace of the game until the very end, and then win somehow. Slow and steady wins the race, that's what I tell you. What point in the game did you really feel that you had it won? 
when he gave up. <laughs> that was it. Hey, also brought something. <laughs> oh, 1996, February 17th. Yes, it's that's a, the Pro Tour. Exactly, with it's a special supplement that they did to celebrate the first ever professional tournament. Here he and is on it, the cover. Here he is in a on magic the cover. Card. And here is his deck list in all its glory with the featured hallowed ground down there and uh, with notes on from which set each card is because that was part oh, of the you rules. Needed to have the yeah, five. Exactly. Wow. And 62 card deck, main deck. Is that a mistake? <laughs> no. Like, yes, it's, it's <laughs> technically it's a strategic mistake. But <laughs> I know it's off topic, but I love that there's a ticket here to pay $14.95 <laughs> to get a VHS yes. as a Pro Tour. <laughs> yeah, are you are you supposed to to uh mail that uh, in in stamps even. <laughs> <laughs> although although it, it it says here qualify for the pro tour yeah but then it lists a, a phone number that you had to call to that's qualify. how you qualify that is kind of how you qualified for <laughs> the first pro tour would love to see games raised to the stature of uh, of intellectual sports i want to wish you all good luck and i really want you to have a have a great time After Michael Oconto's win and the deck being the official godfather of the Azorius Control Mafia, the archetype took another exciting turn at the US Nationals one year later. Yeah, it's a little more than one year later because uh, the Pro Tour was in, in winter, in February, during a blizzard in New York City. The Type 2 format had changed quite a bit since its salad days. The first ever standard rotation had taken effect and the restricted list had gone the way of the Tamagotchi. And also, most importantly, alliances had entered the card pool. And oh boy, did alliances come with a bang. John Finkel, Johnny Magic himself, entered the battlefield with a deck that played Thine Gracious instead of Land Tax, and now use it along with a combination of Brainstorm as a way to shuffle away the unnecessary cards you put on the top of your library. Yeah, my name is John Finkel. I'm from New Jersey. Finding a way to shuffle away cards from Brainstorm became a bit of a trademark of Finkel's by now, along with his Mono Blue Orphidian deck. As we talked about before, Blue-White Control needs a way to win the game, that doesn't take too many slots in their deck, but allows them to eventually, truthfully, hand on their heart, promise that they have a way to win the game if this goes long. Fingal's poison of choice this time was the newly printed in Alliances Kildoran Outpost, which would be horrendous by modern standards. But again, this deck didn't aim to go for a kill basically ever, but just control everything. And then in the end have the inevitability on its side. And Keldron Outpost was just that. So it's just a way to have something in your deck to say, I know the board is stalled, I know I'm not doing anything, but I promise you that eventually this will kill you, so you should scoop now. Yes. Finkel went to the top eight that Nationals, clearly cementing himself as a who's who of the white blue and the clear master of the game within the game. Like F Finkel is also famous, I believe, for this one play where he was super flooded and then at the end of the turn discarded, but he only had one counter spell in his hand, so I think a force of will. And then at the end of the turn, like he didn't play his lands, but at the end of the turn, he just discarded in his uh, discard step force of will. And then the opponent just scooped because, oh God, this must mean his hand is full of better counter spells than force of will. And I can never beat that anymore. I just scoop. Not entirely sure whether that was Finkel or if this play is just attributed to John Finkel. It might also be an urban legend. There's no footage, right? No. Uh. <laughs> and if there were, it would be in like, I don't know, four picks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like Mario. I'm the Force of Will and Outpost Blue White was flying high like a Sarah Angel and you would think that nothing could go wrong. But Wizards had other plans with Tempest Block. Okay, score now is just as 20. <clears throat> you got it. Wasteland, Curse Scroll, Jackal Pop. And this this was the block that first taught decks really how to beat down. Be great. Okay, we're looking at um, in Mike's hand, yeah. Mark's hand. He's got Vision of Sandstalker, Stupor, Coercion, Fire Blast, and three lands. It was not a good time for white blue control. And after that came, of course, uh, Urza's Combo Winter. Oh, jeez. Oh, off from? the top. Good God. That's, that's about the worst thing 
yes. you could have dropped right there. You may may have heard of a card called Solarian Academy and Windfall and Time Spiral. If you thought Eldrazi Winter and Holgax Summers were new crazy one in a blood moon power creep induced rarities, your young heart has not seen the worst of it. That was just one combo deck. They banned Tolarian Academy. Problem solved! Then came Memory Jar, which paired with Tinker made an even more broken combo deck. No problem! You want to step away from Type 2 and play Extended? Meet High Tide! Oh, and Yagmoth's Bargain and Yagmoth's Will! Hogak is a silly little zombie golem that dies to Path to Exile. But people still registered Blue Eye Control. Out of sheer passion for feeling the powers of Yore, but it just wasn't winning anymore. We were playing Blue White Control, but it looks like some kind of 1997 Blue White Control deck to me, honestly. Absolutely. <laughs> Was that your intention? Well, I, I'm, I am old school, so when people tell you to put creatures in your deck, I right away think it's a bad idea. It's like how today when there was always a random 4% of players at any tournament playing blue-white control and no one knows why? But the control freaks would eventually get their reprieve. Tempest went the way of the dodo and damage on the stack, and 2001 came along with a fresh new metagame and... Standard was at a rather moderate power level. A very sedate pace, kind of. Uh, and the big thing that people did was uh, cast Fires of Yavimaya on turn two. And would spice that soup with large green fatties with haste. Blasterderm is a particular culprit and believe it or not, was once a cube staple. Oh, the times. Better go and catch them because they are a changing Blasterderm. Ordinarily wouldn't be able to deal 20 damage to the opponent because it goes away after three uh, turns as a 5-5 creature. But if it has haste, then uh -huh, it can actually kill an opponent. Uh, same with uh, Sapperling Burst. I know it sounds like we're talking about the rise of Gruul Aggro, but half the top eight of the APAC Championships that year were blue-white control, yeah! Because you see... The great white and blue cards were all still around, like this deck also still had Wrath of God, no longer Swords to Blow shares, but it had some last breath. But uh, Counterspell was complemented by Absorb, and there was insane blue card advantage in Factor Fiction and Accumulated Knowledge, at least for the time. This deck also once again had the inevitability on its side, because it would draw more cards, it had the tools to get rid of almost everything, because still no Planeswalkers in Magic. This one, again, would just blank all of the opponent's removal and would win with Millstone. Did yeah. it only really just win with Millstone? Yes, in the main deck it would only win with Millstone. That's annoying. <laughs> it is very annoying, but that is why blue control for you, right? And if you're watching this video, you are one of us, a fan of inevitability. You are here for a good time, not a short time. Then, obviously, once the play Walkers showed up. There was also like white blue control, cherished those very much. And I know this is cheating, but that was the last time the blue white control flag was raised high. Not because control was bad, no, no, but because multicolor spells became wild. Murray's wake shifted the deck into a banned ramp shell. Along with Decree of Justice, it was hard to argue playing some of the old spot removal and card draw. This deck would look into the Aero piles of recent times and probably just think it's staring into a mirror. Soon after Jace the Mind Sculptor became popular in control shells. Those control shells kind of morphed into Corblade. Corblade is the end of control in this era. The deck got Jace and Stoneforge uninvited from the modern format in its inception and generally started an era of panic about power creep. I, I, I'd like to do a deck tech today, but <laughs> Doesn't doesn't have four Jace, but when Innistrad was released in 2012, Delver decks were just too powerful. The combination of aggressive creatures, occasionally with hexproof, backed with efficient spells with Phyrexian mana and counter spells, was just too much for Control to handle. But then Return to Ravnica was a huge moment for Control Mages and the game in general. It brought along some Control staples: Sphinx's Revelation, Supreme Verdict, Azorius Charm, Syncopate, Detention Sphere, Jace Architect of Thought. It's just silly, really. It's almost like Wizards printed an Azorius Control pre-constructed deck in Return to Ravnica. But the Junt Menace was too strong. Blue White Control is only 1% of the metagame of that year total, compared to Junt at 11% and Abzan Junk Reanimator at 13%. Once those subsided, the reign of terror of Mono Black and Mono Blue Devotion began, and almost 40% of the metagame share that entire year. But Control held strong as a solid third deck option. Waving the Control flag up high, Huey Jensen came second at GP Dallas with what is the most true to nature blue white deck I have ever seen. And you want spheres and verdicts. Mm -hmm. That's all that Jensen's deck is. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. 
Outside of one single Elspeth Sum Champion, his only other win condition was two Muta Vaults. If you somehow got rid of those, he would just use his Singleton Elixir of Immortality to shuffle his graveyard back into his library and hope you die of old age watching him draw a card at a time. Blue White then settled down for a few years like a slumbering dragon. Which is ironic because it somewhat came back in nature in the form of Esper Dragons during Tarkir block. Were you the one I was talking to earlier that said you have Shota as the most intimidating opponent you could ever sit across from? Yes. But then Idris Elba himself, Teferi hero of Dominaria, proved his name to be ultimately kind of accurate. Rumors of the possibility of blue-white control became louder and louder during Dominaria spoiler season. Way, way more powerful. So if 5-mana Jace could be played in standard control decks, it's hard to see that Teferi isn't going to be good enough. It petered out at first, but Leo Lahonen brought this beast of a deck to GP Birmingham and lost to none other than our friend Simon Nielsen in the finals of a top 8 that is almost comically only comprised of Rakdos Agro. What shocked everyone at first watching the coverage, including myself, was the deck's utter lack of a win condition. It looked like Leo forgot to bring one. Yes, you had a single Gideon at the Trials that could poke your opponent for four or five turns in a row, but that was not really why you played it. Inevitability was the name of the game here, and your opponent had to just scoop at some point if they ever wanted to get to game two, because what Leo did, which was brilliant, is that he used a defensive ability on Teferi as a way to slowly win the game. It was not fast. He probably almost never got there, but any opponent hoping to grind it out had to know that at some point, Leo would simply let them draw their deck and lose to running out of cards whilst he would keep playing forever. And this is because the card designers forgot to put one very important line of text onto Fairy the word another. Teferi could at some point in the game begin tucking himself back into his library every time you played him. This usually happened after you had taken complete control of the game and eventually ultimated Teferi allowing you to exile one of your opponent's lands every turn. Blue White never really had a great time to shine since then in standard. The cards have just become too efficient. The concept of trading one for one as you just draw cards does not have the same effectiveness it once Even had. Ether Gust something with all the food he has, uh, with Glagoski has access to, with the Trail of Crumbs, he can just find it and potentially even recast it again. But let's turn back the clocks to everyone's favorite format, Modern. Control generally needs to know what it's fighting against to bring the right weapons. I am not going to lie to you, it did not shine at first. Man lands, which are lands that can turn into creatures, were a huge problem for the archetype until Ixalan. The biggest problem with Blue Light Control is that one of its toughest matchups was Tron. You just couldn't interact with their lands very well, you had things like Spreading Seas, but there are easy ways to destroy it. Well, with Field of Ruin being printed in Ixalan, it now gave Blue White Control not only a way to deal with Tron, but as well with so many greedy mana bases in the metagame, you could Field of Ruin a non-basic land, and a lot of decks either wouldn't have a basic land to fetch, or if you use multiple fields, it would just be Stone Rain. Uh, how do you want me to introduce you when I start talking about you? I spoke to modern specialist Harry MTG about the archetype. He is a co-host of the podcast Midweek Metagame with Hall of Famer Gabriel Nassif. Both of them are friends of the channel. Field of Ruin had just been printed into the format, and many pro players gravitated back to the old white and blue. Raf Livy and Gabriel Nassif thought maybe this cool new tool would help against the matchups that used to be challenging. So this deck looks unrecognizable to modern players in the current day era because there's basically no Planeswalkers. We've got three. We've got the two Gideons as well as the Jace. The Jace looks terrible compared to the value planeswalkers we play nowadays, as well as the Gideons is looking to lock the opponent out of the game with the emblem. You can have a peek at the mana base for a little bit of nostalgia. Gab's deck would control the board and stall out the game until he could win with one of his four Celestial Colonnades, a card that is much too weak for today's modern. Another card that really dates this deck is Vendillion Clique, which used to be a staple of the format, commanding a high price tag, yet it has not seen play in modern for quite some time now. Vendillion Clique was played as a really nice thought seize. So what you would do is cast it in the opponent's draw step, you would take the best card out of their hand, and because the card quality in Modern was a lot lower than it is now, a random card is generally better than the bomb in their hand. But, Vendillion Click isn't good in current Modern, because not only is there a load of ways to deal one damage, things like Lava Dart, Fury, Renin Six, taking a random card out of the opponent's hand in their draw step isn't that great because most decks have way more two-for-ones in their hand. Although Nassif did not top eight this event, the return of Azorius Control got a lot of people salivating at the idea of playing Drago control decks. Snapcaster in combination with Opt and Feel of Ruin became tier two mainstays of the format. The format became one brimming with aggressive decks like Affinity, 
Phoenix, and Dredge. All decks at Control and its sideboard bay, rest in peace. We're more than prepared to tackle, especially after the Jace the Mind Sculptor unbanning. This all leads up to my first ever big competitive tournament with Blue Eye Control, and I actually managed to win the event. I brought a nice deck after War of the Spark was released. I played a load of things that may confuse you. Two Surgical Extraction the main, one Absorb, a Wrath of God and two Supreme Verdicts, two Wall of Omens, a Condemn. Some of these specific choices, Surgical Extraction was in the main because of Arclight Phoenix as well as Dredge. That deck was everywhere, especially in the UK, so I decided to play two in the main. Wall of Omens at the time, because War of the Spark provided so many Planeswalkers, the general idea was you play a Wall of Omens on turn 2, a Narset on turn 3, or a Teferi on turn 3, and you protect it by blocking. Isn't that funny? You would never do that in today's modern. I was also playing Absorb. I think a lot of you FNM warriors understand always there's that guy who's playing Burn. At that time, I knew that there would be those Burn players, and it actually helped me win the quarterfinals of this event because I absorbed a Boros Charm. Like the last brown leaves on a late autumn tree, you can see the setting sun of a card we just mentioned. The best and worst part about this deck is this is the last time that I registered four Celestial Colonnade in a modern tournament. Here, I thought it'd be amazing because Colonnade is a great blocker and a great attacker when you have Planeswalkers ticking up, but sadly, it was actually becoming too slow for the modern format. Like I said, the top decks were all aggressive decks, and that was very hard to compete with. As well as with humans on the rise, you needed to be hitting your landups consistently and untapped so that you could cast removal spells, as well as Wraths on curve. This deck is already looking closer like what we play nowadays, but still has some cards we had early hopes for at the time, hopes that have since petered out. I'm looking at you, Narset. We don't play that at all in Blue Eye Control now. Narset was really good against Faithless Looting. Obviously, Faithless Looting is banned now, but at the time, everyone was casting that card, and Narset just made people discard too. As well as Mana Morphos and things like Storm, you had a lot of incidental card draw, which Narset fought. As well as, it kept the justification to play Vendillion Click, as Vendillion Click now became a Thoughtseize, because you have Narset on the table, cast Vendillion Click in their draw step, they bought him the card and draw a new one. Well, they've already drawn a card for turn, so it's just a Thoughtseize. Once again, let's revisit the main thing that we said makes a blue-white control deck a blue-white control deck. Inevitability. You draw one for one and keep drawing cards until you can point to a Jace and say, this will win me the game anyways, might as well scoop. This deck won't have Teferi, Jace, or five hits of a colonnade, but a banning announcement in August 2019 changed modern control forever. The first Modern Horizons set saw terrible few months, often referred to as Hogak Summer. The card Hogak Arisen Necropolis ran the tables, wrecking any opponent it went up against. In its early days, it comboed off as early as turn 2 with a card called Altar of Dementia, triggering your bridge from belows enough to often mill your opponent out before they even get to untap. Wizards banned Bridge from Below to stop the undead menace, but players tuning the deck only realized that it got even stronger and more resilient as an aggro deck. For example, Cadon Feeder sacrificing the Scissor Supplier, you mill some blood gas, you play your land, you get your blood gas, you get to play another creature, trigger your bench find, then you get to convoke three of your creatures to get a Hogak from your graveyard. You're hitting your opponent for 4 damage if you did if you did that uh, and then you also are threatening uh, like from 12 to even 16 damage next turn easily which can uh, well just kill people. It's just spooky wait. as you said. <laughs> Ian Duke published the announcement that Holgak had to be pulled out of the format because it was simply making it unfun. While he was at it, he also jailed Faithless Looting, some say unfairly, and added one line of text that changed the way Control Azorius Mages would view their game plan forever. When Stoneforge Mystic got unbanned, I was planning to go to Card Market Series Paris and I decided to bring the deck. I knew that there was going to be a lot of Amulet Titan at this event and Stoneforge Mystic getting Sword of Feast and Famine was really powerful against that deck. Stoneforge, get the Sword of Feast and Famine, equip it to the Stoneforge, and they really can't do anything about it. This is at a point where removal was not at a high premium as it is now since most of the decks dodged one for one removal. This meant your Stoneforge Mystic often got to stick around. Modern at the time was swamped with combo decks and aggressive decks trying to go under them. Stoneforge could fetch whatever silver bullet you had packed depending on what you was facing on the other side of the table, either Batiskull or Sword of Feast and Famine. What I want to highlight as well is the land base. We only have one colonnade. This is when people were really realizing that you have to curve out in the format as well as look, I have one Mystic Sanctuary, that's a banned card, 
but we were able to play it at the time and that's when it was showing its true power. You needed islands in the deck. But then Modern Horizons 2 and the push in powerful standard legal sets brought an overabundance of removal that was a little too hostile for the Stoneforge Mystic game plan. Stoneforge players of old had to retire their pet cards once more. As this was my last paper tournament before the pandemic, the next time I played Blue at Control on paper was with four Counterspell, four Archmage's Charm. Even your Planeswalkers aren't safe with things like Unholy Heat. So, because everyone's going low to the ground on removal, everyone has efficient, permanent style removal spells, you just can't play things like Stoneforge Mystic anymore, you have to play on the opponent's end step with things like Archmage's Charm. Or Counterspell. Or Memory Deluge. Or Wandering Emperor. Yes! Give it a read if you don't believe me. If you've been out of the loop for a while, even Planeswalkers can be played on your opponent's turn now. You don't ever need to touch your lands on your turn anymore. So the history of blue-eyed control for me? I used to be tap out control with Spreading Seas, Field of Ruin in my main phase, Serum Visions, but now I'm just looking to cast things on my opponent's end step. Draw two with Charm, cast my Wandering Emperor, flashback my Memory Deluge. Thing is, no matter how popular this way of playing the game is, it's just not converting into results anymore. The deck currently sits in 13th place at 2.5% of the metagame share on MTG Goldfish. Just last year, the deck only made 1% of the top eight decks in each tournament. That's low considering it's the sixth best ranking deck of all aggregated modern tournaments after Affinity, Jund, Creature Toolbox Combo, and Dredge of all time, of all time. Does that mean that you think that Blue Eye Control will never be a viable deck again in modern at all? I think right now in modern, the mana bases are too powerful. You don't have to be just limited to two colors. With all the fetch lands and Renin six, you can just play four colors and cast the best cards in the format. So if Wizards even prints a good card, the four color players who have perfect mana will probably just splash for it. So I think that there needs to be a banning or a change to the format for Blue Eye Control to come back on top again. We'll see what the future of the archetype is, but I doubt it has another heyday left in it. Cards are more and more efficient now and the answers are much more polyvalent, making it hard to simply present inevitability. The deck still made the qualifiers of the last Legacy European Tour in Paris, so I'll keep my eyes bright. That's it for now, folks. That's all we know about Blue White Control so far. We'll see what the future holds. Please leave in the comments below if there's any other deck you want us to visit and do a deep dive in. And while you're there, please hit that subscribe button. For every subscriber, Teferi gets stronger and stronger. And as he said on Magic Arena, Dominaria needs us.